Thank you. Um, oh. No, no. Okay. no. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not a speaker. I'm a writer. So my thoughts are best expressed through an editor and edited. And so I'm terribly impressed with you all on a summer night coming out to stimulate yourselves intellectually. I hope I'm up to the challenge. And um, I'm not, um, I, I tell my students at Emily Carr, I'm just an opinionated person with a certain amount of experience. I enjoy throwing my opinions out there um, in an effort to make you think, not in an effort to make you adopt my ideas in any way. That's not my goal. But I hope, or in, at school at, at Emily Carr, I enjoy the provocative tense, I call it. So I allow myself to say, you know, that person's got absolutely no talent at all um, <coughs> to be, make you think. And that person probably has a modicum of talent, but I just disrespect them and I like to just like get it out there. Because <laughs> I'm really opinionated. And um, part of that opinion, like I've struggled, I've worked in the arts all my life and it hasn't been really easy. Um, because I chose to stay in Vancouver because I couldn't be anywhere else. What I, what, what I am here, um, here I feel like an amoeba connected to all kinds of institutions and individuals who can help me with conundrums as they emerge in the process, whatever process I'm engaged with. And in Toronto, I don't even know what, where a street is. I don't know what Cartier it is part of. I don't know anything. So you're always researching everything. So I had to stay here. And you know, I don't know where, how you, who you are as artists. I don't know who I'm talking to. I barely know who I'm talking to at Emily Carr because there's um, no homogeneity in the artists in any grouping of artists, is there? Um, in this room, I mean, I don't know what brings you here, what medium you work with, what level of competency, what training you have and everything. Um, so everybody seems to be terribly unique. So it's very hard to generalize. But um, my conundrum was being unwilling to work outside the field of my passion, like artistry to me, creativity is like, uh, something I feel I was born with and my cho I had a choice of either acting on that or putting it in a bottle kind of thing and doing this to make my income you know so the, the conundrum the biggest decision I think an artist has to make is to what degree are you going to uh, merchandise or, um, your passion if you're going to participate in the marketplace through the expression of your creative n desire or need or urge or whatever, what's going to happen? You don't know when you engage on that path what's going to happen. And so, <clears throat> you know, I'm 67 almost. <clears throat> and so um, I've just finished a script um, and I have to hand it off next Monday. And I've had to learn to have absolutely no attachment. I feel like a Buddhist, um, <clears throat> whatever that is. But um, I have to, it's a very tricky thing, I think, to invest everything that you've got in the development of something and then be able to let it go and watch people misinterpret that or, or layer their interpretations on it. You have to be... Like, what are you going to do with that? It's really hard, I find. Really hard, like, do I go with that or do I fight it? So the, um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, so I find everybody I talk to, everybody who self-identifies as an artist, all these people with nothing in common, um, I realized that I, as I was telling some people I was waiting with outside, uh, the worst word in the world for me now is artist. You know, really, it means absolutely nothing, does it? Like if I tell you I'm an artist, what do you know? Do you know what medium I am? Do I'm a, am I a choreographer or a composer, photographer? What am I? You know, it means really nothing. And <clears throat> now, 
you know, because I'm old and cynical and experienced too. Like, I really resent, I resent some of the people that call themselves artists. I resent it. When I look at your work, I think, what are you thinking? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and what kind of, how much are you investing in, in the development of that which you think is your talent? Like, how much practice, how much learning, how much of that do you do? I don't see a lot of that. So I now reserve that with the word capital A artist for an exclusive group of people. You have to earn that title in my world, one way or another. Um, but the point of the subject here, is, or the subject of the, of the evening, I think, is how society fails us, not how we fail ourselves, sort of. Um, and I'm, I'm astounded, actually, by two things. If you look, if, if I could have a video screen or something and show you all our prime ministers, if I could show you, you know how those video clips of all, where clip, edited little clips of a whole bunch of different things, you know what I mean? I wish I could show you a video clip of um, all the meetings between a Canadian prime minister and a foreign dignitary. Be, be that dignitary, be, be that a, like the Pope or a leader of a religion, or a, re a leader of a, of a monarchy or a, an elected um, official. What do you think is common to every single one of those meetings? Old white men. <laughs> old white men. No, actually. But there's an exchange. There's usually music. There's usually ceremony, choreography, and a gift. And that gift increasingly has been Aboriginal art from Canada to a foreign visiting dignitary. If it's in Calgary, it's a Stetson. If it's um, in Quebec, it might be, it might be some poutine. It might be um, spoons for playing. It might be um, one of those dolls, you know, for playing the spoons. It could be anything. But it's handmade and it's usually an art, an, an, something created by an artist. Get my point? So I find it hypocritical that recognition um, in the, the, the um, importance of artistry to cultural understanding and cultural identity. And yet, look at where ed artistry is positioned and creative education is positioned in the educational system. That's where I think society fails us. And also, not only in terms of the status of educational instruction, because you know, the core curriculum is English, math, you know that? Language skills and so on. And art is somewhere down here. Art is even below, like, well, physical education. Um, and, <clears throat> and I find that worse than that, worse than that positioning in the education system, the worst thing about the education system is, um, how can I tell you? Um, have you ever heard of Ken Robinson, and Ken Robinson, um, Sir Ken Robinson. I thought his first name was Sirkin. Took me years to find <laughs> one. Um, and uh, he tells a, he's an educational theorist. Um, I think he's been knighted for his insights into education, and he's a great speaker. Unlike me, he has these very funny anecdotes and he makes you laugh and then he extrapolates from that story something of importance to teach us. And, and he tells this story of his four-year-old son got put in the Christmas play at his school, pardon me. Um, he, his son played one of the three wise, wise men, um, Balthazar. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had these little things that they had gotten from an aquarium store, like, a, you know, little sea chests. And they had to stand behind a curtain. And when one of the little kids in the play says, behold, a star, there's a star in heaven, you know, God, son of God is born. This curtain went up and these three little boys had to step forward with their little aquarium chests and present gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And um, his son was one of them. And the first one came out and said, Behold, I bring you gold. And the second one said, Behold, I bring you myrrh. 
And the third guy came forward and said, Frank sent this. <laughs> and, um, and his point, coke addict, um, his point was that his little boy at some level knew that he did not know what to say. But he found something that um, acoustically was close enough. And in front of all his parents and in front of an audience, he had absolutely no fear to take a risk. And Ken Robinson tells that story for that purpose because his concern is that in the education system, we teach that out of our children. We teach risk taking out and we we inculcate a humiliation of the er of error. So to be wrong is is wrong in our is bad in our culture. To make a mistake is bad in our culture, and that is created in the educational system of a right and wrong system, in which art doesn't really fit. And and that kind of right and wrong system works against the kind of thinking that creates artistry, really and experience and experiment and risk taking and all of that. That's sad. So on the education system, that's how I think society fails us. In other ways, but um, more than society, I think, um, we fail ourselves. We really are a hopelessly inadequate group of people those of us who self-identify as artists, it's shameful as far as I'm concerned. I, as far as I'm concerned, we're the least accomplished, the least demanding, the most placid people, self-serving individuals in the whole planet. And so <clears throat> we don't, we are so <clears throat> invested in being better than the other, being better than you or different than you or unique unique, unique, and unlike anybody else, that we become more aware of our differences than our similarities. And so, we all exist independently, floating in our studios, alone and unconnected. Sad. And so, we don't have a union. And that, like, I don't want to just be all negative. If I could wish for anything, it would be that all of us who want to be artists, all of us, that all stood up in our country, sort of said, and said, it's time to organize. And all of us would stand up knowing that some of us wouldn't be included, that some of us aren't good enough or hardworking enough. Because if it's worth it being something, there has to be excellence. And so not everybody can get in, otherwise you don't have anything, right? Not just because I want to be a doctor doesn't mean I can be a doctor. You want to be one of my patients? <laughs> Um, but, you know, I can be an artist, anybody can say that. And so, th what, I th what I believe, the only thing, the, the, the biggest thing that the Canada needs is a group of great, brave group of hard-working people who would sit down to define what an artist is, that, in invol that incorporates all the di differences somehow somehow. And you can say, like the Canada Council has to do that in a, little, in a certain way. They don't want to give grants to somebody who's going to flake off later. Like in a perfect world, their money will be invested in people, the right people who will develop, who will spend the rest of their life pursuing the same thing. So the grant from the, the Canada Council becomes an investment in that person's growth towards excellence. Do you follow that? Mm -hmm. So you know, the Canada Council is in Ottawa and they have to give grants across the country. How do they know who to give it? How does a group of people sitting in Ottawa know who to give a grant to in, in Halifax? or Regina, or Vancouver. How do they know? They rely on curators. And uh, the curators are, run our whole kind of industry. They define who's an artist in an informal kind of way. Now, in, a, in my world, if I could make something happen, that I'd start there. At least give those people official recognition, capital A, artists, because if you could do that, my point here is if you could do that, if you could earn that status, capital A, artist in Canada, like, 
and then while you're working and you broke your arm, you'd get paid comp workers' compensation. Uh, and if you suddenly lost your income, not through your fault, not because your work stank, but you lost your income through some other means, you could get workers comp or employment insurance. You could get all the benefits of most other workers if we were organized. It's hard. It would be really hard. But it would be worthwhile for the winners. And the losers would have to accept that they're not what they thought they were. Guess what? But you know what? In my, at school, at school, I, you know, I have to teach a whole course. And all I really care about is that you never let me see your work. I do not want to see your work. Because I want to maintain my respect for you. <laughs> and um, and I, you can blow that out of the water by showing me your work. And I don't want that to happen. You know, it sounds funny, but there are people who aren't good in my classes. And it's true. Might be some of them in here. Um, and they deserve my respect. You know, they deserve my respect because they're acting on their passion and they're taking that risk that those little boys do, that little boy did. So I'm not being insincere. They deserve my respect. But are they a capital A artist? No. There's something else. And whatever that something else is shouldn't be a short source of shame or second best to something else. It shouldn't be. You know? Um, and I think. So sociologically, that's what we need to achieve, is that kind of shift in thinking. To allow, to recognize our excellence and give those people the title that we all aspire to. And recognize these other people are kind of amateurs and help those people get great satisfaction from being amateurs. Instead of trying to judge their success by income or by the, the benchmarks of a professional career. Do you see what I mean? A lot of amateurs are driving themselves crazy trying to be professionals and they don't have the talent. And they'd be better off recognizing that I'm not going to make the bulk of my money being an artist, but I'm going to have a lot of fun. That's fantastic. Because it's a great thing to be. But as I said at the beginning, the risk is taking that passion and trying to make a living from it. It comes at a price. You know? So let me refer to my notes here that are written. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, like uh, Carfac. Um, Carfac was a start. If everybody joined Carfac, uh, and uh, Carfac took some notes from um, the Federation of Canadian Artists. Are you familiar with the Federation of Canadian Artists? It, down on Granville Island? Like, um, um, you know, it's to me, um, all, every, all those mem everything I see in that gallery is really well done and I wouldn't want any of it hardly. But it's really, really well done. Some of it I like, you know. Um, but um, they have an organization, they have statuses of stati of membership and they have an elected body and they say you're this status and you know they have like, I don't know what their terms are, but they have like masters and bachelors and uh, you know PhDs kind of thing they have status and they they administer it themselves they're self-administering so they have a panel that of like standards panel and that you apply and people apply for a raise in status or whatever and you could get it or you don't and that's really brave I think and that's all we need to do the models there it takes guts you know and people but people in the Federation coexist as just members and all these different strata coexist very successfully and they teach each other and they mentor each other and that's what I think we need nationally. And when I look at how artists have the status of artists in Europe, like writers in, in Ireland get, a, if, if you get published in Ireland, if you publish creative fiction, you get a salary for life. The more you publish, the more you get as a salary. Same thing for opera singers in Germany. You know, uh, when you look at how artists are treated in different cultures, it's really enlightening. In a lot of cultures, there is no such thing as an artist. 
It's everybody is. Art is part of life. It's not a separate thing like in our culture that's commodified for our capitalist structure. Um, so we're really unique and we are pretty disadvantaged compared to other countries. So, that's about it for me. Um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems to me that to actually, somebody else can ask a question. It seems to me to actually uh, have a union of artists, you have to tackle that age-old question of what is art. Yeah, or, um, no. no what, well, yes, what, what, what meets certain standards? Not what is art. But what meets certain standards? Okay. I think that's different. How does that look? Yeah. Because I find that... Well, you either, you've either had... It, but that means an artist is someone who makes this much money, or this, per, this percentage of their income from creative expression, mm -hmm. or has this training, or achieved these milestones. That's something like that. Because at the Canada Council, I mean, I don't know now, but you used to have to have been in three curated shows to get a grant as an individual. So that's sort of, the, that's that what they're... Of yeah, a yeah, artist. yeah. And I sort of, all my life have thought, well, if you have had a Canada Council grant, even if I think your art is super ugly, <laughs> uh, you're a capital A. Right, okay. Yeah, or... I still In, in our society, because it gets so, it gets so diluted. Yes, but um, every profession, I mean, our, our architects are just a bunch of artists who have formed an association and defined professional standards and hived off for themselves a profession, but they had societal support because they designed things that people could go in and get killed. <laughs> so um, by having standards right. on that form of artistry, architecture was important. You know, um, and, and every, you know, like when you go on a movie set, mm -hmm. like when I'm on a movie set, the writers, the sound people, the director, the costumers, like there's 30 unions mm -hmm. of represent where every form of human behavior has formed a union with standards. What's the, why, how do, why do we, can't we? What are I, we, I think you know? We I do I too. It's that, hard. That's going to be part of the equation that we're going to have to figure out is how to define what is art. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of politicalness about not wanting to touch that. Yeah, yeah. Not wanting to criticize from us. somebody else's mm -hmm. art. Yeah, yeah from so our, so, yeah. The other thing I wanted to oh, do you want to say? okay. I was just saying it's, it sounds similar to what the athletes are going through with the amateur uh, status versus, versus professional. Yeah, yeah. Now they're looking at yeah. these amateur athletes have been treated so poorly. Yeah. Some of them didn't even have enough food to eat. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're not being supported. Well, they so didn't have enough food to eat. Unionizing. Well, a lot of athletes had no food to eat, no money to spend, but they had enormous amounts of money in a trust right. yeah. it, to protect their yeah. status as amateurs. And, and the coaches weren't allowed to help them. because no. was against the rules. Yeah. So you, I think it's looking at kind of a similar thing. How do you... Journalists, photographers, designers. In each of those, you should hear both the... Um, lowercase and uppercase. Yeah. Um, and we continue to have that discussion. And photographers have really, like, well, photography wasn't recognized in Canadian law as an art form until within the last few years. Like, re fairly recently, right? Yeah. It was not, and it's, it is so different because, um, and that's their difference, their unique force them into a professional is a professional status because if I pay, draw your picture I own it if I take your picture you own it yeah. so that created a huge division between photography and art and that's that you know but it got solved by perseverance by photographers and we could do that those of us who want to be artists we could do that we could take charge is any other country, is there another union that has been formed? Another well, 
in Soviet society, there are people who are recognized as artists who get who are who earn who are supported because they're capital A artists. I'm not, by the way, a political animal. I don't want you to think I'm pro anything. Um, I, I'm not a political person, but I just look at that the structure, and I do find um, that this is a capitalist society we live in and um, you know I skewed I just started skewing from the minute I decided like I didn't want to do something else and do art on the side I didn't want to do that um, you know I had to start stop doing what I I had to start doing things that would sell I had to start thinking about the marketplace as part of my process you know, and the best thing, I was telling you guys out in the street, um, now that I'm retired, I'm having the time of my life because I've got, you know, I'm financially secure, and so now I can go back to like being a kid again um, and do whatever I want free of any concern of, of, of the marketplace, but I'm kind of hooked on money now. You know, it's, I'm really happy when something is going, wow, this looks like it'll sell. I'm really happy when that happens. Well, can't help it. But I had to, you know, it was hard to lose that. I'm a, I am often thought of myself as a complete whore, but, um, you know, I'm not a poor, poor artist. Whoring's good, in my experience. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, I switched to thinking to a great degree that being an artist is an attitude. Huge, that became my big thing. It isn't what you, be, your behavior or your product, it was your attitude. So I, I got high, I was offered money to do things that I didn't really want to do, um, but I found if I did them really well, you know, if I thought if you're going to pay me big money, I want to use these like really expensive pigments or go through this really expensive medium and stuff like that, and I would experiment with new things that I couldn't afford to work with and turn that, that that process, that attitude towards what it, to pandering to the market, kept my integrity together. You know what I mean? I didn't just go for the money, but I got out. I did. I, you know, I, sw I paid. I painted swimming pools <laughs> at times, but um, <laughs> um, but they were. I I did them. I'm really proud of them. I'm proud of the design, and the owners hadn't like they were really proud too. And I. That led to all kinds of things because I did it well. It wasn't, you know what I mean? I could have done it quick and dirty, but I did it well. So anyway, questions? No? No, what is that? Pardon me? I write scripts. I don't do um, art, visual art for movies. No. Yes, yeah. Sounds great, doesn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> what if, um, theoretically, you're in a city that continues to have a dearth of galleries and a uh, public that doesn't buy art on a regular basis. In this theoretical city, how might we improve that? How? <laughs> how do you? F well, you know, it, it, a gallery. I mean, I think he needs to educate people on changing culture, developing. Culture. Um, you stayed in Vancouver. Yeah. Because you couldn't be anywhere else. Uh, many of us would like to stay, but feel um, that it's slowly becoming impossible. I think uh, the word, when your question, the word that really struck me was the word gallery, because galleries seem to be like so irrelevant and so last century. I just think they're dorky, and the model is broken. It's, and um, I think they're. You know, oh, I wish I could undo, I wish I could like develop a drug that my students would drink that would, if they drank it, they would lose that kind of orientation to focusing on the gallery. Because it's really hard to get that out of their heads. And I want, don't know why they want to go there. I just don't, I don't get it. Because they take half your money and you're a mouse in a maze. You're one of like 60 people in their, in their stable. Mm -hmm. It's so insignificant getting representation. Don't you think part of that? To, to a person's career, I mean. 
I think one of the challenges is, um, and then there are those who run galleries like this space um, that without it, we'd be headless bodies looking at shit on the internet, continuing to not buy anything. Yeah. So the physicality of it is one way to show that here's a place that you can go and look at art, and it's actually a place that you can pay for art. You know what, you know what you're getting at? Um, in first your original question, if you went to that city, how do you make a change? Um, what I want to tell you is, I feel terribly insignificant person. I'm just a little normal person, that kind of thing. And I, when I graduated, my class had their, you know, 20, 10, 20, whatever. I didn't go to my 10 reunion. I had no reason to want to go. And so I, when I went to the 20th reunion, I was stupefied by how I was perceived. Because I'd been in the paper, starting this gallery and stuff like that. And I'm insecure. And I walked in there, I was the star of my graduating cohort. Mm -hmm. And I walked in like thinking, I got to stay for like 40 minutes and then I can go and I'll just walk around and look what's, you know, like I have no self-esteem. And it was so shocking to, to, to be perceived as the star. And I paid attention to what was going on. Nobody knew what the hell to say to me. They don't know how to talk to me. And they put you up on this pedestal. Is that your experience? Like, people don't know what to say to an artist. Like, when I meet a doctor, I don't know anything about medicine, but I've had surgery. I'll go there. You know, you can talk to a doctor about your surgery. You could do, but artists, people are scared. And I think in an, in an art gallery, they are afraid to say what they like or don't like. They're afraid, right? Would you agree with me? We're intimidating, is what I'm saying because of our big words and blah, 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 and our pretentious attitudes and stuff like that. So, to answer your question, if yeah, I went to a town like that, I would find other people like me and I would use social media with skills like Rachel has to reach out to everybody that I knew and demystify art, to take that, that pomposity and that scariness out of the equation for people so that they're free to ask questions and free to like and dislike stuff. They are afraid to say anything. And if you could break that down, art becomes their friend and then you've got progress. But you know, like when you go to the Vancouver Art Gallery and you see a show and you look at what Dinah Agaitis writes on the wall, the, co the, you know, the coaxial interjection of remedial cultural expression is, you know, da 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 like that. And I, you just, that works, you know, that disappoints me because people go in there and they think, God, I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And art makes me feel stupid. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, I, I think. Pardon me? Who? Speak in jargon. I totally agree. And, that, and when people use that language, we lose our audience mm -hmm. because it, we make people feel stupid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a shame. And I, I wish art galleries were diplomatic centers. You know, um, Leanne Davidson, who was the curator at Surrey, like, who's my total idol, I just worship her. She brought these, she ran the Surrey Art Gallery and she had to figure out a way to keep it, its standards high for funding, but relate to the community. So she brought these photographers that were elite photographers from across Canada to Surrey, and she told them, here's your job. Find some, student, find some kids in Surrey and photograph them in their bedrooms. That was their job. And you know, what's sacred to a teenager? that bedroom. So those photographers had to, had to earn their entry into those bedrooms. They had to befriend Surrey kids to get into their bedrooms to photograph them in their bedrooms. And at that opening, to see all these kids who had never been into an art gallery and their parents and their aunts and their uncles and their friends and seeing themselves, you know, through the eyes of recognized world-class, I hate that expression, artists, photographers, it was a spectacular thing. You, in that, not that opening, I saw what art galleries can be, and what art can be, and what, how it can relate to the public. It's fantastic.
down in the, the, um, the International Artists Union in the film business. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, there is a stand, you have to go through the process to get in. And, uh, but once you're in the union as an artist making money on a scenic painter, um, you still have to wait for jobs to come up and things like that. So it's relevant on how, based on how you get jobs, what movies are being made, TV shows and things like that. So um, there is kind of a union like that just for, for film yes. uh, in this city. Yes. And all of well, like, the world of the world, right? But um, there is a certain standard, you know, that you have to be in paid get into and wait and you have to do so many hours before you get into things like that. So um, But and then you just you earn a status. Yeah. And like you say, then you you hope to get called. Yeah. But you you will get called over you right. people will call you because you have a status. Yes. Also once you're in and you're making good money and the whole bit everything's fantastic, you're there's basically crews of people and little tiny pockets of groups that only work with people and if you don't do something right or if you flip somebody wrong or you talk too loud in the lunchroom, you're not in that group anymore. It's basically yeah. you're you're out and it's that fast. So it's kind of a brutal union. Um, however there there is kind of something like that. Um, but you know But I think it, that it an artist's union would be hard to create. I'm not stupid. Yeah, no, it but it would be worthwhile for those who got in it. Yeah. And if for those who weren't in it, there'd be a clear methodology Absolutely. about how to get in. And yeah. people who don't have talent would see that they, they're and get, go in where they belong to something yeah. else. They do definitely, like when there's levels and they can tell when you get to a job site of 20, all these people in here will all get to the job site. And they can just then watch you, see how you work, and then these people are pushed over here. You're going to take over this section, blah blah blah. And uh, it's still a fight every single day to get on, even if you're on the, you know, you still got to. Um, uh, but you're you're still you're still um, reliant on the, the jobs that are out there. Um, you know, I could wait. Um, I, I waited 12 years to get the call, and then I now I went from you know I got a you know a job that takes 20 years. To, I got it in 11 days which is fantastic, but now it's still waiting around for the next job. So um, we're still, you're still reliant on what work is out there, even if there wasn't a union to be done. Yeah, but if in every union and in every profession, the winners are going to be people who work hard yeah. and have the skill set. It's one thing to get into the union, but you need more than that. You have to, yeah, yeah, you have to have you attitude. You go in at 7 a.m. or 5 in the morning, you still got to fight again to, to do to get up there and be seen and get the next job. And once you get that job, I'm fighting for the next job, three jobs down again, because you know it's nothing's guaranteed again still, even though I'm in the union, and I've got all my RSPs that give you everything, all the benefits, everything you could possibly imagine, but um, you're, you're still trying to fight to get that next one again, because I could be, I could wait 12 more years before I get a call again, right? Yeah. And so you're kind of still relying on, on the work that's out there. If there's no film work, you could have a great union, but you're not going to get any. Nobody's going to get paid, right? The model of union is broken. I mean, we know that because the, there's still a hierarchy. Whether you're as a paying due member and you are accepted to the union, there's still shitty union members. And there's great union members. There's going to be people that excel in their trade. There's going to be people that suck at it. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. The union that we're talking about at the very beginning is education. There's still the highest union fee possible for a student going to that degree. In the end, they're certified, but they're still being put to a certain degree. Yeah. So it, it's. Yeah, um, you're saying about creating a union, though, so I, mean, I appreciate that, but it, it requires a new model. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I'm just using a word, because even like equity, I belong to Equity's Equity. It's not a union, it's a trade association, but it, it enjoys the benefits of a union, collective bargaining, and it gives you, it gives it, it educates its members and looks after its members. But it's not technically a union and it's self-governing. But it, it, all you do, what I mean is that we as artists do something to define categories of membership and status so that the rest of society, its governments and all its agencies, can interact with us, those of us who we recognize as excellent in our, in our career and our profession. I just wanted to make a comment about arts and education. Um, I have a going on 15-year-old 
child that I raised was incredibly uh, okay academically, sucked completely in that. And uh, she would not be able to get into any fine arts program in any high school in Vancouver because to be in those programs, you have to be really good academically. And some of them you have to have a B or at least a C plus or a C. And so what that means, and I've said this to them, is that you don't really have a fine arts program. You have a big fine arts program, you have an For academic academics. program parading as a fine arts program, and you wouldn't ask somebody who is in a science program to get an A in dancing if no. you continue it. And, and so, you know, that's just another way that we really do ingrain in kids, little kids, all the way up to high school, that art does not. But, but also, um, you know, in, to me, my mind, in, at school, at, my, at Emily Carr, one of my real goals is that at the end of my course that you recognize um, the products that you make, whether that's a sculpture or a painting. Um, that's half of the equation, half. Custom, consumers of art need a story, a narrative, words, something that goes with that item. Otherwise, there's no satisfaction. And so you, you need a proficiency beyond creating the object in words or storytelling or personality. Um, that, that, that's an essential component to success if you're in the marketplace with art, I think. So some academic things, I think, is important. Some, some expression, yeah. But not a filter. Right, right. You can get an A in all your art stuff, but if you get a C in that, you're out. Yeah. You're out of the program. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't get to do art anymore. You yeah. don't get to do the thing you're really good at unless you get an A in that. Yeah. So that's because you said art is a mystify. I find this opposite of seeing you're a doctor, an engineer. If you say an artist. Well, you know, <laughs> yes and no. I find artists get a lot of respect. If you're. Successful wow. artists do. Yeah. Successful they say, artists do. Yourself, then mm -hmm. they think yes. Or what awards? Or how you conduct? If you look successful, they'll be. You know, it's a game. Everything's a game. <laughs> Everything's a game. I think. But, it, but it's fun to play games. But in Japan, if you say an artist, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you say an artist in Brazil, you're vagabond. I'm looking. Vagabond. vagabond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I think in some of those places you can only be an artist. Being an artist means you can afford to feed yourself. Here, in some ways, the label means the reverse for small A artists, perhaps. Yes, I, I, it always comes down to this word. <laughs> We're talking about artists, and that word has... Like, when you say a statement that contains that word, everybody thinks of a different thing, a different kind of person. It's so hard to have a cohesive, I mean, a cogent conversation with a group about artists. <laughs> everybody thinks so differently. You know? well, I've been doing photography for years. I took some classes at Langara. I still don't know whether I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. Am I, I mean, I still can't even answer that question for myself. I could. So. <laughs> Give me 10 minutes. <laughs> but I'm, I mean, it's really easy. It's really easy for me to, to, to put you in categories. I see the world in boxes. And I'll put you in a box. And I have all these boxes. And my students, the first assignment my students have to do, and I really, I spend three hours setting them up for the assignment. And their first assignment, nobody can fail. There's no evaluation. But I want to know. As, I want you to make work as hard as you can to tell me what you want to be, where you want to be. Where do, you, wh where do you see yourself in five years or ten years or what's the ultimate success? How do you define that? Where do you want to be? And then I keep that for the whole rest of the course so that all, as all your assignments come in, I can mark your assignments in the context of what you want to be and where you want to go. Um, and you set that. And if you tell me you want to be an amateur, I'm totally going to help you. But if you tell me you're going to sell, then you're, I'm saying you're getting into dangerous territory here. 
Because, like, make up your mind. Amateurs don't sell, you know, in a hard-ass kind of divisional world. So if you're going to sell, then don't tell me you're going to be an amateur. Because you've got to figure out a different, you know, I want names to help me understand exactly what your goals are. And if your goals are success, then what, is, what does that involve? It's real easy. I love doing that. At the end of that three hours, I know how you are going to define success. It's either this many sales or this percentage of your income or a show in this, any of these galleries. You just, I want the specifics. And you know, if you tell me all that, then I can give you a category that helps you and helps me for the rest of your life know who you are and where you're going. I don't like the word amateur because that has taken on connotations of um, skill set. So I use avocational. And that just means I'm, I'm totally into this, but it's not, I'm not going to try and earn all my income from it. And then when I know that's your goal, I'm going to treat you differently in my evaluation than somebody who wants to be in the National Gallery in 10 years. If you want to be in the National Gallery, okay, then you're going to, boy, are you going to hear from me about your work <laughs> and your work ethic. But if you, that same person says, all I want to do is be in, you know, maybe once before I die, have some, one painting at least in the Port Moody Art Center, <laughs> I'm going to have a completely <laughs> different attitude. I want to help you get there, but it's, I'm going to have a completely different attitude towards you because that's a modest, simple goal and here's a, here's a path. The other one is really challenging and you're going to have to take some severe criticism and work really hard and, and you know, be subjected to like microcosmic view of your, what, what, what your, I mean, um, an examination of your process and your motivation and your objectives. And if you can't answer all that, all that for me, your goal is you need to have a lot of work to do to get to the National Gallery. That, so I just want to help people understand what's ahead. It shocks me that you go to BCIT and like plumbers and electricians are like us, self-employed people. Artists are self-employed people. You know, and if you want to be a, um, an electrician at BCIT, 30% of your instructional program will be in self-management of a small business. Mm -hmm. How to do taxes and invoices and HST and GST and all that kind of stuff. I'm it at Emily Carr. You get me for half a term in four years. And I'm your professional development person. And I have 26 hours to teach you how to be a working professional. Mm -hmm. And an electrician has 30% of his instructional hours in that. Like, and that, that pattern is set by the P administration of Emily Carr. People are supposed to be acting in our best interests. And you know what? what ha do you know what happened in, in Canada? Like, time is up. Um, like, two, three weeks ago? There was, do you know that Canadian artists were fighting for, in the Supreme Court of Canada? <laughs> and you know who they were fighting? The National Gallery, like God Almighty, yeah. what's wrong with that? When the National Gallery is fighting paying artist fees to artists, yeah. imagine all of the galleries in the country, all of those art galleries, they have nothing without artists and they didn't want to pay fees. And if they don't have artists in their walls and they don't want to pay fees, they, get, they want free material to make money. It's obscene. So that's, that not, it's a really, that's a very telling structure. That's why I'm so anti-gallery. Because you can make, you can do more for yourself without one. Thank you. We don't have to just end no. the